Okay, thanks, Tim. That was a great setup for me. <clears throat> um, what I have to talk about is is pretty big picture in terms of the California statewide uh, water imbalance, and uh, also I'll bring in a, a climate change perspective on this as well. Key points I'm going to get across. Uh, water storage uh, is water security. <clears throat> question is where to store the water. Secondly, climate change is, is already making surface storage or reservoirs less reliable in California and other places. And this puts even more emphasis on the need for subsurface storage in California. By far the largest space to store water is underground. <clears throat> Winter recharge on farms and floodplains offers massive, though largely yet unrealized, uh, opportunities. And alternative management of reservoirs and groundwater is key. We haven't really operated these two systems uh, together very much yet. And then lastly, uh, if there's time, I'll talk about soils and geology, which are key to su successful recharge of the aquifer systems. <clears throat> In terms of water storage and water security, uh, basically, in California, we look at, at four major stores, uh, snow, mountain groundwater, which really doesn't amount to too much, surface reservoirs, and alluvial valley groundwater, such as in the Central Valley, there, that big valley in the middle that, that Tim also mentioned. <clears throat> We've lived off the snow. Snow gets us through our, our annual drought period, which, which occurs in spring, summer, and fall. Um, but uh, one of the messages here is the snow is going away. Um, the surface reservoirs has been has been the major store that's been managed in the past statewide. Um, the other big store is alluvial valley groundwater, but that has not been managed that much. <clears throat> and of course, 95% of all the fresh water approximately is in is in the groundwater. So first, looking at climate change um, and what, what's happening, California is a Mediterranean climate, meaning most of our water comes in winter. And uh, every year we have what on the East Coast would be regarded as a drought. That is, there's hardly a drop of rain or snow between May and October. <clears throat> we get through that, in, uh, or have gotten through it in the past, by storing water in snow and exploiting that. Climate change brings more prolonged drought, more intense winter storms, earlier snow melt, and loss of snow storage, and we're already seeing that. <clears throat> so this next slide, this shouldn't be a much surprised anybody, but it, it shows projections from climate models of loss of, of snowpack, um, which indicates that essentially uh, with time, uh, the, the snow is, is being diminished appreciably and in the future uh, century or half century, we can expect to have much less snow storage. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, the total uh, water uh, coming into the state, the total precipitation has, has not changed much over the last century. And uh, um, also an important important point here is, is that we're already seeing the effects of the loss of snow storage. This slide shows snow melt runoff between April and September as a fraction of, of total runoff in the state. Total runoff has not diminished. <clears throat> But the all important snow melt runoff during April to September, when we historically have filled up our reservoirs to get through our dry uh, summer and fall, um, is, is diminishing as, as shown in the two major watersheds in the state for the last century. There's a century of data here, the San Joaquin Basin and the Sacramento Basin. <clears throat> What's happening here? Well, um, the snow is melting sooner and we're getting more uh, rain on snow events. So again, the total water coming in the state is not changing, but um, that snow melt runoff is, is diminishing appreciably. What does that do? Well, it makes it harder to store water in the reservoirs, which has been our main mode of water storage in the past. Plus, if you have a prolonged drought, these reservoirs uh, last only two or three years. <clears throat> our recent drought was, was five years that Tim, Tim mentioned in the perfect storm. So <clears throat> the question is then, we're losing surface storage effectiveness. What do you do? <clears throat> By far the largest space to store water is underground. <clears throat> and uh, here's, a, here's a graph of groundwater overdraft trends which have, have created much additional room for storage in the Central Valley. And I might just, just to, to bring in the big picture 
groundwater overdraft issue, uh, California's average annual overdraft is about 2 million acre feet. That's a lot of water. Most of that is groundwater uh, overdraft in uh, the Tulare Lake Basin. That's the southern part of the Central Valley and the um, San Joaquin Valley. So <clears throat> groundwater overdraft trends, um, uh, these are, are some of the most massive overdraft trends in the world. <clears throat> And this also helped bring about the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in California. Um, that has resulted in available space for storage of water. If we look at available Central Valley storage volume <clears throat> in the state as a whole, there's 140 reservoirs that, that can store um, about 42 million acre feet of water. That's a lot of water. <clears throat> in the Central Valley subsurface, conservatively, there's room for another 140 million acre feet to store water. So if you're looking for space to store water and you wanna advocate for surface storage, well, maybe some of that would be useful, but uh, in, uh, the big uh, opportunity is obviously in the subsurface. The question is how to, how to make that happen, <clears throat> exploiting that more fully and creating greater water security for California would require massive increases of recharge in a place like the Central Valley. And how do you how do you accomplish that? I'm gonna quickly go over this, but in this, this next bullet, winter recharge in farms and floodplains offers massive opportunities. And I'm gonna explain this in two very simple slides. <clears throat> Here's a depiction of the San Joaquin Valley, part of the Central Valley, uh, pre-development and post-development cases. <clears throat> Pre-development, we had groundwater discharging to rivers. We had a lower water table um, and natural vegetation in the basin. Uh, and uh, post-development, pumping from wells, primarily for irrigation and water supply, drew down the water table. The streams now losing, most of the streams are losing. Uh, but a consequence of this was a massive increase in recharge. <clears throat> Much of the water for the irrigation also came from surface reservoirs uh, from from the Sierra Nevada. <clears throat> so here's what happened. <clears throat> Re irrigation increased the recharge by a factor of two to three. Pre-development Central Valley recharge was about 2.6 million acre feet. Post-development Central Valley recharge was more than 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 double that, 5.6 million acre feet. And uh, the differential is even greater in the southern part of the Central Valley than the northern part. <clears throat> so that's a, a due to irrigation. That's a two-fold increase in recharge. There's also recharge from the rivers. Before development, the Central Valley floor rivers were receiving base flow, so there was a negative recharge, if you will, negative 1.2 million acre feet. Post-development, the Central Valley floor river recharge, uh, the streams became losing, so we have net recharge from the streams to the detriment of some of those stream ecosystems. <clears throat> but um, we, we have about you know, 1 million acre feet of gain. So that's a 2.2 million acre foot swing in, in the river recharge. <clears throat> so we know two things. Irrigation can be very efficient for recharge. There are downsides to it that I'm not gonna go into here, <clears throat> but if we're trying to store water, using irrigation lands is one option. Also the rivers and their floodplains are also places where recharge can be accomplished and uh, this is where reservoir releases and floodplain management uh, comes into play. Um, some of the, the, the ideas put out here are parallel those of Bridget Scanlon. So for further reading on this kind of thing, I might suggest you look at Scanlon et al. 2016 environmental research letters, an excellent work on, on uh, parallel uh, thinking. So Helen Dalka, my my colleague at UC Davis is, is doing a lot of work on this. I'm not going to go into it, but the idea is take the excess winter flows from the rivers from the earlier snow melt in the winter and spring, and for more intense storms due to climate change, distribute it on irrigation lands for recharge, not in the summer, but in the winter. <clears throat> and uh, the idea is to, um, again, you know, significant, significantly augment the, the recharge on a regional scale using techniques like this. Another approach is to open up floodplains. This is a picture from the Central Valley during uh, past floods <clears throat> where um, uh, 
uh, abundant recharge is, is occurring in that case. So in all of this, alternative management of reservoirs and groundwater is key. What do I mean by that? I'm going to go in, get into that through a case study that we recently completed as part of the University of California Water Security and Sustainability Research Initiative by a research team that's, that's listed here, where we, we looked at reoperation of a reservoir and downstream aquifer management to maximize total water storage. <clears throat> the area is on the American and consumptive systems shown here in this map. And here's a, a zoom in on it. Sacramento is, is in the lower watershed there. The lower watershed has the, the groundwater basin. The upper watershed has the reservoir and, and the headwaters. I'm not going to talk about the headwaters today, but that's also part of our study. <clears throat> to make a long story short, we've uh, redone the, the reservoir operation, otherwise called reservoir reoperation, a multi objective optimization that maximizes total water storage in the reservoir for a time period of 1994 to 2003. Also maximized hydropower. The upshot of that is they were able to reoperate the reservoir to achieve a similar or a little bit greater um, reservoir storage. <clears throat> um, so this is just optimizing based, based on the weather and, and climate and so forth. <clears throat> now the key part of this though is the diversion of excess flood flows from that reservoir, uh, from those reservoir releases to accomplish a, a increase in total system storage with both the reservoir reoperation and recharge of divertible high magnitude flows. We're talking about flood flows or high magnitude flows coming down the river and through the reservoir that are above uh, mostly the 90 percentile for, for flood flows. The results are shown here. <clears throat> And what we achieve is, is over time, if you accumulate year by year increases in total storage benefit, an increase of about 4 million acre feet of storage in the reservoir. Now these are annual uh, improvements in reservoir storage. Uh, you don't actually uh, get the cumulative uh, storage at the end, but in the groundwater, <clears throat> we're assuming all the divertible water is recharged. You get almost another 4 million acre feet of storage in the groundwater system. <clears throat> if you um, try to recharge that water. So keep in mind the state water deficit, the overdraft deficit is about 2 million acre feet. Even if these are highly optimistic, this indicates the num number potential for recharge is, is quite large. <clears throat> so now let's, uh, those numbers do not include the, the, the consequences of trying to recharge in the groundwater system or the hydrogeologic limits on, on recharge. Uh, uh, a dissertation was just completed by Rob Gailey in our group on groundwater system reoperation, where it's groundwater modeling the recharge and also combining the economic aspects so as to um, look at the costs of incentivizing the recharge on farms. Again, to make a long story short, results show in the upper left here uh, during the simulation period, and we have the baseline without effects on groundwater recharge or efforts to recharge the groundwater. And we have essentially decreasing groundwater storage with the recharge just over a 20 year period, we see the significant increases, not as high as uh, the total water diverted from Folsom Reservoir, but still quite significant. Also increases in stream base flow in the upper right and some uh, excess flows into adjacent basins. <clears throat> So the, the last uh, point here is, is on soils and geology as, as a key to successful recharge of aquifer systems. To this audience, I'm sure a lot of you are geologists, this should be obvious, but I think I'm, I'm basically out of time, but if there's, there's time to get back into the soils and geology uh, aspects of this uh, at the end of the, the webinar, I'll hold those slides for later. Uh, with that, I, I thanks, thank the audience for their attention. <clears throat>